Good morning, North Mountain. Hope you are doing well. We are going to be starting a new book this weekend. So we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. If you do not have a Bible, there are blue Bibles underneath the seats in front of you. That is our gift to you. Please feel free to take that with you. If you're in the blue Bibles, it's going to be page 1093. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from the God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain people not to teach false doctrine or to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies. These promote empty speculations rather than God's plan which operates by faith. Now the goal of our instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Some may have departed from these and turned aside to fruitless discussion. They want to be the teachers of the law, although they do not understand what they are saying or what they are insisting on. But we know what the law is good, provided one uses it legitimately. We know that the law is not meant for a righteous person, but for the lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinful, for the unholy and irrelevant, for those who kill their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral and homosexuals, for slave, tra slave traders, liars, perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound teaching that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God, which is entrusted to me. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Amen. All right, let's rock and roll. My name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here. If I haven't met you, I'd love to meet you. We'll have coffee with the pastors after this at Starbucks. Head over and come talk with me or Xavier. Uh, if you're new, we are a church that believes the Bible is the word of God. It is true. It is infallible. It is authoritative. So we sit under God's word every Sunday. So what I want to do is just give us an opportunity for you to sort of posture your heart. If you're new here, if you're new to church, last service I met three gentlemen who haven't been in church in years, and they're just coming and they're sort of taking their first steps back into this thing. I don't know where you are, but God, I believe, wants a relationship. His word is the way we get to know him. So I would just give us all a chance to sit quietly and ask God to speak to you this morning. So let's bow our heads. And just privately with ourselves, have a moment asking the Lord to speak. Father, you are still speaking by your word, through your spirit, focusing in on your son, Jesus as the ultimate revelation of yourself. So God, for everybody in this room, I pray that you would speak to them. We would hear what you're saying, and we would submit to what you're saying. God, only can that happen by your spirit. So we ask your spirit to be alive in this room this morning. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So again, if you're new, I didn't grow up in church. I grew up kind of Catholicly. We went once in a while when Grandma was in town to make sure she knew we were good Catholic people. Uh, so I got to the Bible later. So I know that's not my story alone. That's some of your story. So I just want to give us a heads up on what we're doing. Then we're in this new book, First Timothy, Sam just read. So what is First Timothy? I just want to answer a few questions that the text gives us right out of the gate. Uh, what is First Timothy? If you will, let's just read verse 1 and 2 together, and I want to give you a few uh, handlebars to grab hold of to understand what this book is. Verse 1 and 2 says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus our hope. And to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So just based off that little intro, what is Timothy? Here's the first thing we got to see. It is a letter. It is a letter that was actually written by the Apostle Paul, penned by the Apostle Paul, passed along so that Timothy and his hearers would hear this letter. What uh, church people call this is a pastoral epistle. That's a fancy way to say it's a letter written about church leadership. There's three of those, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus. But this is a letter, and now it's in our canon. We believe this to be the inspired word of God. But its original function, just so you know, was a letter that was passed on to this young man named Timothy. Next up. Who's it written by? Written by this guy named Paul. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. 
What is an apostle? Again, I don't assume everybody knows that. And not all Christian denominations agree on what that means. An apostle is a close affiliate of Jesus. You think of the disciples, if you've watched The Chosen All, those disciples, those became apostles except for Judas who went and killed himself. And Paul got added to that mix later on. He calls himself one of those late to the game, but he was a close associate and a a witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and namely seeing Jesus Christ after he resurrected. And those apostles, the word apostle means sent, were the sent ones. Well, who sent them? Jesus Christ. Why did he have to send them? Because Jesus was ascending to heaven 40 days after Easter, his resurrection, and he was going to send, he was going to send the apostles to be his authority on this earth. And what were they going to do? They were going to start the church. So they go and start churches, and they write letters and epistles and gospels. And what we're reading in the New Testament, again, another big word, apostolic authority. Why do we think the New Testament is trustworthy? Because it comes by the hands of apostles, or apostles agreed and signed off on this is good word. This is from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So what we're reading is words from an apostle. In the book of Acts, they replace an apostle because Judas dies, and they you know, flip a coin So the Lord can have the decision. He chooses Matthias to replace Judas, who is now out. But this is written by an apostle. We don't believe that they're still modern-day apostles. They were the foundation of the church and then to be built on by others. But there are still apostolic sent missions that we have. Part of being a church plan is being a sent, a missionary sending agency. Here's the next thing. To Timothy. Timothy's a younger guy. Most people think he's in his 30s, so think... Mid-30 to 40, some people say even 40, and he's being mentored by Paul. He's the protege of the Apostle Paul. Fun fact, his faith is all credited to his grandma and his mother. So mom's in the room who just barely got in here because your kids drove you nuts. (laughs) They won't ever write a section of scripture because it's closed. However, they could have a a sound faith, a deep well. Strictly from the influence of grandma and mom, praying and teaching. Like, don't underestimate what you're doing, moms. That's the second thing. And then here's the last thing. It's for the church. It's written to Timothy, who's a church leader in Ephesus, which is modern-day Turkey. I've been there. It's now just an archaeological fun place to go. But originally, it was this booming society, this Vegas-type reality where churches were being planted by the Apostle Paul. And Timothy is now leading those churches. And it's written to Timothy to be read over the church in Ephesus to help them structure their church. Now, what is this book actually about? I want you to flip in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3. And I want Paul to give us his reason for writing this so we align with his reason. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. Paul gives his reason for writing this letter. I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, meaning if it takes me longer than I think, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of truth. Why is he writing this? Because the church matters. And specifically, the behavior in the church and the belief in the church matters a lot. The church is the pillar and buttress of truth. Where? In the world. Where do people find truth? In the buttress and pillar of truth, the church of the living God, us. It's very important what Paul's writing. And Timothy's a younger leader, lacking confidence, and he wants to remind him of this task and the importance of this simple little thing that most people drive by and never think twice about. This matters. It's the church of the living God. It's the pillar and buttress of truth. That's why he's writing this letter. Now, I want him to set the tone early on. What would be the first thing he would address as he's writing to this young guy about church? And here's how I think you should take offerings. You should have a box in the back. You should have envelopes. No, I want Paul's tone to set the tone because it's going to get heavy quick. And I just don't want to take credit for that. I want Paul to take the credit for it. (laughs) So verse 3, let's read it. First thing out of the gate. Paul, get it. Here he says, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. Pause right there. Most time when Paul writes a letter, he starts off extremely encouraging and prayerful. I thank God. For the many blessings of the fellowship I have with you, my brothers and sisters in the Lord, fighting the good fight. I just love you so much. Twice he goes like, 
right at it. Galatians, before he gets even finishes his first sentence, he's like, and I got to address something with you. What are you thinking? <laughs> In 1 Timothy, right out of the gate, your job is to charge certain persons, he's going to name actual people, to not be teaching anything that does not sound doctrine. He sets the tone right out of the gate. So just that's, that's what this is about. It's about teaching sound doctrine or protecting against false teaching or protecting against a church that wanders is how I think about it. Because that's what swerving, certain people who have swerved from these is what the scripture says. So I'm going to give you an example of swerving that the church is not allowed to do. So Harvard, great institution, never got into it. <laughs> Their original mission statement included this line in there. Everyone shall consider as the main end of his life and studies to know God and Jesus Christ. This is eternal life. Come to Massachusetts, send your kids to Harvard. Current mission statement, it's to advance new ideas and promote enduring knowledge. Now here's what I don't want to... That's fine for an educational institution. You can change your mission statement to align with however you view education. But the church of the living God, the pillar and buttress of truth, cannot swerve at all. When you swerve, you are no longer a church. You're a cult at worst. You're a pathetic social gathering, more likely, with some talking head saying stuff that has no depth or weight or substance or truth. We cannot swerve, and Paul says, Timothy, do not let them teach anything that is not sound doctrine. So today, three questions. What is this false teaching? Why is it temptation? And then finally, how are we, North Mountain, not them out there, but us, how are we going to combat this? So that's what I want to walk through using this text. So first question, what is false teaching? Let's just read together, starting in that verse 3 down to verse 11. Or verse 7, I mean. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths, endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than stewardship from God that is by faith. Paul says, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding, I love this line, either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. That's a tagline for humanity right now. You don't know what you're saying, but you are extremely confident about what you're saying. <laughs> Paul says these people avoid. What, how, what's the specific verbiage he uses? Verse 3, certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. And then down verse 10 and 11, don't let people teach that which is contrary to sound doctrine. That first one in verse 3, don't teach any different doctrine, is one big Greek word. And it means to teach divergently. Don't let anyone teach divergently. And don't let anyone teach that is not in accordance with sound doctrine. That word sound is healthy. Do not let anyone bring anything in here that does not line up with healthy doctrine. And that's false teaching. And then the words he gives, just to flesh it in for us. He talks about myths, endless genealogies, speculations, vain discussions, and those confident in their assertions but not actually understanding what they are talking about. Now, just so you know, Paul is going to get very specific. He's going to name names in this letter. And I'm talking about, he's going to write it down. He's going to bring up certain things, but a lot of it's going to be left to, we don't know fully all that was going on, but that's what he gives us. These myths, endless genealogies, speculations, endless vain discussions that aren't in line with sound doctrine. That's false teaching. Now, I want to give us a helpful framework to just how I think about this and how I think you should think about this. But here's the first one, and it's going to be very basic, but I want to start here. All teachers... Good, bad, the greatest Bible teacher you've ever known teach false things sometimes. That's just a reality of being the person up here. You say something offhand that you didn't mean to say. You teach, you get to a hard passage and you've got to make a decision about what this means and you land here and one day I'm going to meet Jesus and you say you were off on this one and this one. Your end times wasn't great and you're, you know, that's just reality. So we, no, but no teacher can say, and the false teacher did anything wrong. Slap a label on. No, chill. But false teachers, 
Here's how I describe them. They teach from a false foundation. Meaning what they're standing on to present to be an authority in your life is false. They have a false foundation. Now, what are those foundations? Here's how I think about it. It all starts with S, so it's biblical. So let's just walk through. Here's the first one. How do you know a false teacher? Their story is wrong. The Bible is a story about God's actions here on earth. It starts with in the beginning and it ends with the new beginning, new creation. Lots of people have wrong views of the story of the world. Just the most popular one that's everywhere is evolutionary answers to the reason and purpose of the world. How did this world get here? Evolution. How is this world taking its next step? Evolution. What's the end goal of this world? Whatever evolution says. That is false. That is wrong. That does not negate science and pieces of science that look at stuff and try to analyze how stuff changes and moves. But to say that is the story, that is false. Mormons say the same words as us. Jesus Christ, grace, gospel, scriptures. If you ask a Mormon who actually knows their faith, their story never lines up with ours. Their creation story is way out there. And then you move along. Well, we're still not lined up. And then well, let's get to the end. What's your end goal? That we never once lined up in this story. False teacher. False doctrine. Not in accordance with Scripture. Next one. Sin. The law is wrong. People redefine what sin is. I'm going to spend a lot of time on this in the back half, so I'm not going to spend much time here. But this is the temptation that Satan brought into the garden that has never left a single human heart a single church, a single civilization, this desire to redefine that which God says. We don't get that right. That's God's job. Next up, salvation. They get the gospel wrong. Now, this one is a little more nuanced, but I'll just tell you one of the big gospels that we live in in this present day age. I don't think people use this language because gospel is a church word, but gospel simply means good news. Well, what's the good news that people are aspiring for, hoping for in their life? A simplified version is, I want to be able to express myself fully in the safest possible way where no one contradicts that, and to live as healthy and as long as I can. That's the end goal of humanity, across the board. And it's in this very room right now, and we've bought into it, that I want to express myself fully in the safest possible way for as long as possible. That is the end goal of humanity. Why did God create us? So I could be fully me, whatever that means, for as long as I can. That's the good news. That is not the good news of the scriptures. There's no wrath of God. There's no punishment. There's no Jesus. There's no cross. There's no lots of things. There's other denominations that I think swerve from us in how they view faith and works involved in salvation. Well, who's responsible for salvation? Jesus Christ did the work. I simply place my faith in him, and I am justified. Catholics and Protestants got into it a few years ago. And Protestants, which I am and we are as a church, diverge from that which Catholics were teaching. Namely, that faith and works sort of work together. And it's like, okay, well, who gets credit here? And you can go read very long doctrinal statements. But that anybody who says salvation is on you, be careful. Finally, Savior. This is the easiest one to spot. This would be the sweet Jehovah's Witness ladies that are at the park I'm at every Tuesday and Thursday with my kids. The sweetest, the kindest, the most pure-hearted, seemingly women I've ever talked to in my life, and just so gracious, and 100% wrong on who Jesus is. Jesus is fully God, fully man. He is the mediator between God and man. He alone atones for sins. And when people swerve from that identity for Jesus, it's false teaching. So... I'm going to say some wrong stuff from time to time. But the second, one of these slips or swerves, remove me from this spot. That's the point. Because who Paul is going to tell Timothy to remove actually end up being leaders. And a lot of people think they were elders in the churches there. So this is not like a, those morons out there. This is like us in here. And leaders, people respect. You're our C leader, your best friend. Me, Xavier, key people in this church who started to swerve from the foundation of sound doctrine. Here's the second question. Is why is false teaching so tempting? And this is the easiest thing in the world to answer. 
This is not a complicated answer. I mean, I can't be more confident in my <laughs> assertion of how easy this is. Here's John Mark Comer. He wrote a book, Live No Lies, which is amazing. And he has a, just a helpful summary of Satan's playbook. Here's how the devil works. He takes deceitful ideas that play into disordered desires that are normalized in a sinful society. Satan, the flesh, the world. Why are these so tempting? Because the deceitful ideas that get brought in from those who are teaching doctrine that is not in accordance with the gospel, it is not something that's icky to us. Those deceitful ideas are appealing to us. Eve, don't you want to see the world like God sees the world? Don't you want to know right and wrong? Don't you want to just have a little more view than what God's given you? You know what? I do. I should have a view like God has of this world. All of it's broken. And now the system we live in is rigged, and we're part of the problem. Deceitful ideas, bad teaching, with desires in me that grab hold of those that are normalized in society. Think about it like this way. These deceitful ideas come in through teaching. They take root in the soil of my heart, and they grow. And then I walk out, and I notice, oh, other people have the same sorts of fruit as me. And it's like, well, obviously, this is the right way to live. No, that's Satan's strategy just on display across humanity. It's tempting because it's in us, and it grabs hold of our heartstrings. Now, specifically, how do we see this? In this section here, Paul uses a word sort of repetitively, and it's sort of the key to understanding this. I want to read verse 8 through verse 11 with you. How do these deceitful ideas get into the church, Paul says? Verse 8. Now, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for sexually immoral, for men who practice homosexuality, for enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God, which I have been entrusted. The word he uses on repeat is law. And these deceitful ideas are coming in through people teaching the law, not the way the law is supposed to be taught. And that's still happening today. Now, if you're newer, what are you talking about when you say law? Ten Commandments? Yes, that's part of it. Even Paul's here. Most people think this little summary statement is sort of a reflection of the, first, uh, the Ten Commandments. The first ones kind of talk about our relationship to God, first four. And the last ones are how we uh, hurt and sin against others. And it's against your parents. It's against others in sexual ways. It's all the ways that you sin, all wrapped up and summarized in the Ten Commandments. But I think Lutheran people, Jimmy Curley, our sweet Jimmy, just gave announcements, grew up Lutheran. They have some great thinking on law and gospel. And I want to use the Lutheran view because I think it's the most helpful and faithful to Scripture. What is the law for? Other way to say it is how do you teach the law in a way that's in line with how the law is supposed to be taught without being a church that's like overkill? Here's the three uses of the law. Here's the first one. It's a fence to protect. Why is it illegal to murder someone? Because God said don't murder work arrogant enough in 2024 to think all the good laws that protect people were somehow our, our idea. Early civilizations, murder was like just how you handled stuff. It was like raising four boys. Like whatever that is, that's society. And it gets normalized. Until this wonky little group called the Jews started to present a different option. Thou shalt not kill. What? Who says I can't kill? And all these sexuality laws. As a way for God graciously to give to societies, to give to families, to give to churches, to give to individuals as a fence to protect you from that which you don't want to cross over into. And it covers every area of life. So the law is a fence to protect us. Here's the second thing. And this is the one maybe if you grew up in church, this is the one you've heard. It's a mirror. Meaning the law is meant to be looked at by you And you're convicted by what you see. You're not supposed to, my kids out on the sports field, as they do something that they think is amazing. And Ozzy's Superman chest, LeBron James, (laughs) 
We don't go to the law and walk away. Thou shalt honor thy father and mother. Nailed it. (laughs) Paul says, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? Jesus tells the rich young ruler, do the commandments. He says, "I, I, I did those. Okay, well, let me show you a different angle of that same mirror. Sell everything and follow me. And he looks at that portion of the mirror, and he walks away sad. I didn't want to be convicted there. It's a, Paul calls it a tutor to lead us to Christ. It's a tutor, a person that's there to guide you towards Christ in need of repentance because you are not lining up when you see the law. And then the third use is this. It's a path to God. I think this area, our church is sort of, you know, everything's a pendulum swing. Older folks I talk to in this church, 50, 60, who grew up, you know, Jesus movement, grace-based churches, I'm all about grace. That's how I got saved. That's my only hope in life is that Jesus is gracious. You can come from that vein and hear anything where a church leader or church is telling you, well, do this this way, and hear it as, ah, that sounds like law. It's about grace, 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 grace. So we in Xavier has a formation plan for our church. It's not like, oh, maybe if you think about it, get around to it. It's like, no, we think you should do the things we're talking about in our formation. Call it law if you want. It's a path towards the good life. And I just know the pendulum's going to swing. And 30 years from now, the sweet little kids that grew up in this church are going to be complaining about this stinking church, all their laws (laughs) and rules and formation. Ozzy's going to be talking to his counselor about all the wicked things we made them do. (laughs) Well, tell me about this church, Ozzy. Tell me how bad it was. It made me Sabbath. What? (laughs) Tell me about that. That sounds bad. Yeah, they gave me a day off every week. My dad made pancakes and bacon, and we just enjoyed the day. Can you believe the audacity? (laughs) We laugh, but that's all what formation is. It's a path to the good life. All those are needed. And Paul says the way it gets wonky is when people are misusing the law. Just real specifically, I'm going to sort of hit some pain points now. So here's how we also use the law. We don't allow it to say what it says. We sort of white out the part we don't like. Or we use it as a way to puff ourselves up, especially against other believers. And both happen in this book. So I just want to read two not connected pieces at all, but that I wouldn't choose to teach just on my own. Like, you know what I want to teach about this Sunday? This. But it's here, so we're teaching it. Read verse 10 with me. In the list of sins, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, and enslavers. Sexually immoral, that word is porneia. Anyone who does anything contrary to sound sexual ethics. Homosexuality and enslavers. All in a row. There's men who are like the pillars of faith in American theology. George Whitfield preached like crazy. He also fought to keep slavery legal in the state of Georgia. How do you get there? You skip over, you glance over, you don't let that law hit you like it should. And then there's a whole cultural moment that reads this sexually immoral men who practice homosexuality and say, ah, that's not. That's not, that can't be what it means. It is what it means. There's a a way God wants sex and gender to be utilized and lived out in this world. And anything that teaches divergently from that must be addressed, especially in the pillar and buttress of truth, God's church. So we cross out what we don't want to hear or we puff ourselves up we're going to get this in chapter 3, but there was people using food and restrictions in a way that made them seem better than others. In our context, it's those of us that get really good at some of this formation stuff, and we start looking down on others who don't Sabbath as well as us, <laughs> who don't simplify their lives as simply as we've made our lives. That's the human heart. It's wicked and gross, and none of us really like it, but it's what we're stuck with <laughs> until glory. For now, we have the Spirit doing its work trying to fix all those little things. But that's why it's so tempting. It lines up with stuff that's icky inside of us, and it just gets really easy. 
Now, how are we as a church going to combat this? There's a couple options. We can just fight everyone that teaches something that's not online. That's a, a method in this day and age. You go online, and everybody's fighting everybody. It's like whack-a-mole. And this guy said this. Oh, boom! That's, I don't think that's the heart of Jesus, and I have no appetite for that. You could stick your head in the sand and just hope this passes over. Men, in the beginning of the Bible, a man sticks his head in the sand. And that which carried a deceitful idea enters his home and deceives and distorts, and the whole world is broken now. And Adam takes his head out of the sand for a second to take a bite of the same fruit. So what are we going to do? Here's my hope, is that we would have an awareness of false teaching and we'd have a focus on good teaching. And I just want to give you a, a sort of an underneath the hood of me as a pastor. Here's the areas where I think we need an awareness of. And again, I'm going to keep poking, but part of a pastor's job is to shepherd in a direction that you would not naturally want to go. A way to think about this, too, one of my best friends, Rob, grew up in Florida. He would tell me about how to escape from an alligator. How do you get away from an alligator? You zigzag run. If you run straight, you're toast. So you zig, you zag, you zig, and you zag. Okay? You're welcome. I feel like the goofy Christian world we live in is trying to tell everyone how to get away from an alligator. It's like, I've never seen an alligator. I saw a scorpion in my bathroom. How do I kill a scorpion? That's what I need. What we're reading is a, why do I say that? A local contextual letter that applies exactly and specifically to Ephesus. And now by the Spirit, it applies to us. But that context out there, your uncle's context in Michigan, your sister's context in South America, we're all a little different. So we all need a local awareness of what we're dealing with. So what I'm talking from is my own heart for you, my people, my church, our church. What am I aware of? Here's the first one I've already talked about, but sexual ethics. Some of you have a non-scriptural sexual ethic that you are maybe living out of yourself personally or you are holding to for the sake of people in your life. I just want to say, 500 years ago, people were fighting different fights because the culture was different. In the Middle Ages, they're not fighting about sexual ethics. They're deciding about murder and how many people you're allowed to murder and it still be okay, not too frowned upon. Fast forward, we obviously know murder's wrong, but now the sexual revolution is here. And we live in this water, this stream of flow that we did not create, that was created long before any of us, and that we're now in, and we have to decide, is my view in line with this or something else? And everyone, I just know this about all of us, we're all way too confident in our ability to make decisions on our own. You, you, you don't make most of your decisions on your own. You're in this, it's like when we go to the beach, and I'm watching my kids right here, they're right here, and then I go read, and then my kids are way the heck down there. How did they get down there? Because the water pushed them that way. What is your sexual ethic? Because the Bible is very clear. Our maleness matters. Our femaleness matters. The expression of male and femaleness within sexual intimacy matters. Why? Because it reflects back something of the beauty and nature of our creator. That's why. So when you play with it, you lose that. You lose an image of God that God wants us to have based off how he created us. So here's my just, again, I, I'm convinced more of you than I would like to know hold a sexual ethic that I think does not line with scripture. What do I want you to walk away with? Here's just a little thought experiment. Tell me about an area of your life where God has contradicted you, presented something contrary to what you're currently living in, believing, and you have stopped, changed. The word is repentance in the Bible. 
and then lived according to this new way. Because I think the sex thing and all that is tied to a deeper issue. I know it is. It's an authority issue of who gets final say on life. Is it the creator of the universe or is it me? Our cultural moment says me. Me do me. You do you. The fullest expression, go with it, whatever that is. That's not what scripture says. Here's the second one. Uh, the only way I know how to say this is YouTube prophets. So I, I don't, I'm not a huge YouTube guy. I'm trying to figure out how to catfish, so I'm going to YouTube. But a lot, especially my guy friends, watch a ton of YouTube. And the guys that have sort of faith and they're in church and they watch a lot of talking heads on YouTube. And I just think most of what I hear them relay to me about what they're watching is at best silly, at worst pretty detrimental to your faith. Because here's what I hear, and it's all sides. It's, well, you know what they're saying? Like, no, I don't know what they're saying. And then we go and watch this video. I'm like, I knew where this was going. Most of those folks are speaking about those issues over there that are ruining everything. I don't, you can correct me if I'm wrong, send me a video. I'm not going to watch it. I don't watch videos I'm sent, but to make yourself feel good. Those people out there are the problem. Most of those people don't ever make you sit with the mere aspect of the law and make you a better person, husband, friend, ex-husband, neighbor, because they're too busy. And just so you know, I'm not a smart business guy, but it's not that complicated. You can't grow a following talking about things that are pretty agreeable. So you have to talk about the fringe and the hot-button topics, and you have to talk about it in a way that will get attraction. So we live in this world where people are fired up about the Democrats. It's like, based off what I see in your life, it seems like cheeseburgers and Coors Light is your issue, not the Democrats. <laughs> so once you can put a cheeseburger down long enough, then I'll maybe listen to your political views from that goon. Again, are they false teachers? I'm not going to do the work to go watch them all. But I think a lot of them are very unhealthy and unhelpful. Third one is this, and I'm going to try to nuance this well. The counselors in your life. And I exactly mean actual counselors, therapists. And we have therapists and counselors and psychiatrists in the room. I'm all for it. I'm seeing my counselor Tuesday this week. I have a psychiatrist's company that I recommend to almost everyone. I'm meeting with people like, hey, you should talk to them about, like, I'm all for. However, we've made, again, the pendulum has swung. The authorities in this cultural moment are the counselors and those that are advocating for the, the health of you, which is very important in your healing, which is of utmost importance. But unless you figure out a way that counseling fits in with your overall discipleship plan, I think it can go awry quickly. Like counselors have zero authority in your life. Pastors have zero authority in your life. Except that which we bring this to your life as the authority. This is our authority. Nothing else. Do we need to talk to people about Past trauma, yes. Do we need to see people? Yes. But I just, again, it's like the YouTube videos. You're going to have these intersections in life where you have a few different opinions to choose from. Well, your RC leader says this, and your pastor says this, and your counselor says this. And you, being the independent person you are, get to choose. I would just encourage you. Is the word the final say in your life? Or is it the most recent voice that gets into your heart and pulls on the strings that are deceitful desires inside of you? This is why Paul says, teach these people not to have any of this sound, unsound doctrine in our place. That's, what, that's, my, that's as hard as I'm going to get. If you want to talk more personally, I have very strong opinions. I have people listed on YouTube that I'm not going to share publicly. But I think we just... Have a gross diet. It's like watching my kids after Easter, like, oh, gross. Yeah. <laughs> Jelly beans and then chocolate and then those and then that. That's what you're going to live on? You know? 
What do we want to live on? Sound doctrine. So what are we going to do to focus on good teaching? This is very simple. We as a church will teach the whole counsel of Scripture. We're going to teach Timothy. Then we're going to go into the Psalms. And then we're going to go into Matthew. And next year we're going to go back into the Old Testament. And we're going to teach the whole counsel. Why? Because I would not pick slavery and homosexuality as a topic. You know what I want to kick off after Easter with? Slavery and homosexuality. I think that great idea. But the scripture dictates what we listen to, how we live. So we will teach the whole counsel of God. And then finally, Paul. Here's what's fascinating. Because people can claim that the church has all these issues and it's bigoted and it's narrow-minded. And there may be a lot of truth to that. But the essence of this, Paul says in verse 5, what's the point of having good teaching versus false teaching? Verse 5. The aim of our charge is love. The end goal of what we do when we stand to teach God's word is that you would be a more loving person. You would experience the love of God in your life. You would love God back, and you would love others with the same love that God has loved you. That's the end goal. And we're not here to fight, to make people feel stupid, to belittle, to pick on people. We're here to love, and you only get there through good teaching. And this cultural moment has tried to convince us, ah, you need to shut this if you're going to be a loving person. No, the only way I know how to love is by opening this up. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. That's our prayer, church. Loving community, pure hearts, clean conscience, and sincere faith. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, shape us over the next few months in this book. And God, as you press on situations and beliefs and ideas that we hold true or we've maybe never thought of, or we've never once stopped to consider if what we think and how we view things are in line with healthy doctrine, are in line with what you would have to say. So God, help us to align ourselves with you not to go be the right ones in arguments, but be, to be the loving ones in any situation that love you and love others with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. Jesus, make this true of our church. It's in your name I pray. Amen.